Hi, this is Robin Trower. This is the Blues Podcast. Hello and welcome to another edition of the Blues Podcast with me, Big Boy Bloater. Hello. Uh, today, I'm very happy to say I'm here with guitar supremo and all-round nice guy, Robin Trower. Hey, how you doing, <laughs> Robin? Do. Doing good, thanks. You're looking great. You're feeling fit? Yeah, pretty fit, yeah. Glad to hear it. Glad to hear it indeed. Now, uh, I want to talk about all sorts of stuff today, but I thought I always like to kick off by going right back to the start. Can you even remember that? Yeah, the beginning, yeah. <laughs> the beginning. <laughs> yeah. Do you remember what it was that sparked your interest in guitar playing? I do. I mean, funny enough, I was writing about it the other day. Um, it was Scotty Moore on Elvis's Elvis, Mystery Train. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, yeah. When I heard Mystery Train, that was the first time that an electric guitar got inside my head. Right. Where I thought, what the hell is that? You know, <laughs> and... I think he's the one that in inspired me to get my first guitar. You know. So do you remember what year it was that you heard that? It must be... Because that was out about, what, 55, 54, 56? 55, yeah. something it's yeah. around there. Yeah. Right. So I think, yeah, I, I was about 10, I think. Right. Yeah. And how did you hear? I mean, being a 10-year-old kid in England, how did you hear a record like that? Uh, my brother, I had an older brother, was buying records. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I must have been a bit older, 11, maybe 12, something like that. Anyway, he was bringing 78s in, right? You know, yeah. and I heard it blown away. That was the beginning of it, really. But what do you think it was about Scotty's playing? Was it like the echo on the guitar, or was it just the fact it was an well, electric it, guitar? Or it, Fantastic sound. Yeah. I mean, it was a fantastic sound. Um, but, you know, his ideas... Yeah, uh, were just fabulous. You know, it was very much a blending of. That's when rock and roll was really kicking off, wasn't it? I mean, it was very much a blending of like country and rhythm and blues. Yeah, all coming together and all that kind of thing. Is there any sort of particular part of that that you were more drawn to, or is it just the general sort of rock and roll? It's here now. Yeah, right now. I, I think um, you know around that time, I, I remember a few records that I really loved. You know, I, I remember liking. Uh, Bebop Alula by Gene Vincent right. and, you know, um, a couple of other things, maybe Everly Brothers. You yeah. know, I remember around that time, that year or two years, being a lot of fabulous stuff. Yeah, that's very much the dawn of rock and roll, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. So, you hear Elvis, you hear uh, Scotty Moore playing guitar. How long did it take you then to get your own guitar? I think um, it must have been a couple of years. Uh, I, my dad bought me one for Christmas. Um, I think it was about 13 or 14. So had you been like banging on about it for ages? Yeah. It was like, <laughs> and it, finally, yeah, yeah. finally they gave in. Yeah. Do you remember what it was, your first guitar? It was a Rossetti. A Rossetti? A Rossetti, um, what they call a cello body guitar. Right, yeah. yeah. It's like the arch top kind yeah. of, uh, yeah, with the F holes and all That's that. That's it. Yeah. 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 And a, it wasn't long before I, I put a pickup on it. Because it had to be, you know, you, you knew it had to be electric. Yeah. And I was somehow plugging it into the back of a radio. Right. <laughs> which I thought probably, when I think about it now, is probably pretty dangerous. But yeah, yeah. Uh, but when you when you first start playing out and you've got the enthusiasm, you do tend to. I mean, I remember doing exactly the same, mm. plugging into my dad's hi-fi system somehow, and like you know, yeah. get, getting a sound out of it. Yeah, it was exactly. Like, that seemed to be the greatest thing, didn't it? Suddenly there was there was this electrons moving air kind of sound and it was yeah. like oh just that's the beginning of it isn't it it's the science behind it all isn't it yeah. how can this pick up make this uh yeah it's fantastic do you remember back in those days uh what your first song was that you learned to play no i can't i can't remember what that would be can't remember or too too embarrassed by what it was no, <laughs> I, I think it might have been the chords to an everly brothers song right um I can remember playing them very early, very, very early. That early Everly Brothers stuff always had mm. such a beautiful, the lead guitar always had a lot of that tremolo kind of effect on, didn't yeah. it? And I always thought that was really, really, really nice. Well, particularly Absolutely. on the slow stuff. Yeah, the, yeah. The guitar player used yeah. the tremolo. Yeah, that yeah. was very, very effective emotionally. It was, yeah. Powerful, you know. Yeah, it's great, great stuff. So where did it go from there? You started uh, about 1962, was it? You actually started playing kind of first gigs yeah i think it, it probably between 60 and 62 but it wasn't really until 
um, I formed a band which became the Paramounts. Right. Yeah. Um, that you know there was any sort of proper gigging or anything. You know. Yeah. What sort of places were you playing back in those days? Um, little coffee places. Right. Yeah. Um, and then gradu- gradually went into pubs. You know, that's that's where the, where the main gigs were. Right. Yeah. The, these old pubs always had a, had a hall. You know. Yeah. A little hall. A little function hall out the back. Yeah. 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 Um, all round South End, and then sort of further out into Essex and that. Yeah. Did you when you first started? playing did you see it as if like this is going to be my career for the rest of my life kind of thing or was it just no i don't think so i think at that age you're just doing it for fun you love it no plans yeah at all. don't make any plans at that <laughs> just, age just blowing in the wind yeah, eh? just <laughs> exactly drifting along so what was what was the first your first memory of like proper full-on pro gig i think the sort of the first professional thing you could say was that when we went up to London to make a demo for the first single, which was uh, Poison Ivy. Right. Yeah, so, and that's when it started to feel like it was getting a bit more serious, you know. We were signed to um, Parlophone, and um, actually the demo was, was much better than the, the record they ended <laughs> really? up doing at Abbey Road. <laughs> I mean, uh, it was great to be in Abbey Road and all the rest of it, but it... it it wasn't as good as the demo. Why do you think that was? Was it just something to do with the energy on the day or? I think a lot of it was to do with the sound. Right. Yeah, the, the sound, if I remember rightly, the studio was called IBC. And the engineer there at that time, uh, you know, obviously he was young then, but he ended up doing the Stones and right. the Who and people like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Do you still have a copy of the demo? I don't, but oh. I'm sure Gary does, <laughs> Gary Brooker. Right. I'm sure yeah. he'll ha- have it, yeah. Well, uh, let's talk about Gary, shall we? How did, how did you meet Gary? Uh, well, we were local musicians, you know, uh, in the South End area. And um, he was playing for a little two or three piece without drums, I think it was, um, with, a, with another, a guitar player who was a friend of my brother's. Um, and he, he was an excellent guitar player, especially for that time. He was really, really top guy called Johnny Shaw and um, because I was a big fan of a band that used to come down to South End from Romford a band called the Rockefellers right yeah who were you know they were sort yeah. of like two or three years older than, than me uh, I was a big fan of them uh, so I, I I sort of thought a piano would be great because that's that was their lineup yeah and um, that that's how the Paramounts came about really right mm. see yeah. that we used to be called the baby Rockefellers but by them <laughs> right yeah, yeah. yeah. not officially hey just not to, officially no no, no 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 uh do you miss those days now i mean you know everything's so complicated these days now and it's just, you miss the, the simplicity of all that i can't say i do no 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 i mean playing live now still has the same buzz for me right. so you know it's yeah i can't say i miss it yeah no. <laughs> um let's talk a little bit about uh Procol Harum. Uh, so you, you joined the band just after White a Shade of Pale. Yeah. Uh, and you were with them for, what was it, four, year, four or five years? Yeah, five yeah. years, I think it was. Yeah. Well, what? yeah, five albums, I think we did, yeah. That's, that's not bad going, is it? No. Yeah. Fun times? It was great. Uh, the way I think about it now is that's where I got my schooling. Right. For touring, proper touring, you know, especially in the US and recording proper yeah. proper recording albums and that's where i learned quite a lot yeah how much uh, input did you get to to give on those albums not a tremendous amount i don't think you know i think um gary always wrote and he would always leave space for me to, yeah. to play some leads you know uh, and i'd maybe occasionally write the odd thing with keith reed and uh, but as time went on i was writing more and more and it was all guitar music. Yeah. Um, so I eventually had to had to leave to to go and do that. Pursue your own. Yeah, mission, I mean, I was, I was writing yeah. a lot of music, you know, yeah. and it needed an outlet. Yeah, I mean, I've been looking back on on your 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 back catalogue, and it's you know over thirty albums, right? As a solo artist yeah. with the Robin Trower Band. Yeah. I mean, thirty albums—that's a lot of albums, right? Yeah. How do you find the inspiration to keep coming up with new stuff? Well, 
I think I was, <laughs> I mean, it sounds sort of a bit strange, but I, I think I was blessed with a, a very powerful creative engine. I think it's, it's a gift. Yeah. And um, it's driven by the love of playing the guitar. I mean, I love to play the guitar. Right. So, And quite often I'll pick up a guitar just to practice, you know, just to play sort of thing, and an idea will come. Yeah. So um, it's a very, very organic process, the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. How do you see your... Do you, do you think your writing has changed over the years? The last few albums, I say, say the last three or four albums, I think I've been a lot more honest about digging into the sort of catalogue of stuff that I've absorbed early on. Right. In other words, the blues, rhythm and blues, yeah. rock and roll. I think I, I've been more honest about um, bringing that through, you know, yeah. um, which I think what I've been looking for is, is just to be making more soulful music, you know, as soulful as possible. Right, yeah. 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 And I think that that shows a progression over the last three or four albums. Right. I want to talk to you about guitars as well. Okay. Because, I mean, you say, you know, you love guitars, right? You love playing guitars. Yeah. You love guitars. Uh, you've been around the industry long enough to see a lot of guitars come and go. And uh, I heard the story about you uh, picking up the strap for the first time, at like a sound check, right? And sort of discovering, having this epiphany of like, oh, my God, this is a guitar, right? Yeah, yeah. How did that all come about? Well, uh, I was in Pro Call. Uh, we were on tour with Jethro Tull. And... Um, we were opening up for them. At Soundcheck one day, uh, Martin, who was the guitar player with Jeth Jethro, um, ha had his second guitar on the stage, ready for his Soundcheck sort of thing. It wasn't a guitar he used, it was his backup sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, and I rather rudely picked it up without <laughs> asking him, plugged it into my amp, and I thought, ooh, I like that, that's good. Um, it immediately had a response here and here right yeah um and i've since thought about what it is about the strat and i, I think it's because it has a human voice quality to it other guitars don't have it's a very organic guitar though isn't it Strat? it's, it's you know contoured in the body and everything and it's it is much more i find it much more sort of a human connection to it almost it's got such a musical uh quality to it doesn't matter how much you overdrive it right or yeah. crank it you know <laughs> it's still quite a musical sound yeah because i mean you, you spoke a little bit about your first guitar about the arch top you had uh what sort of guitars were you playing before you discovered the strat i was playing les paul right yeah it's a nice guitar yeah, beautiful guitar les yeah. paul sunburst um yeah i'd always played les pauls up to then uh well i say always before that before I joined Procol, I was playing a Gretsch solid body. Right. Which is kind of similar to a Les yeah. Paul, a little yeah. bit of a Les Paul kind of guitar. Um, but no, I, since picking up the Strat, I, I haven't looked back really. Right. Yeah. All those guitars that have, you know, you've played back in the past, are they all gone sort of? You, yeah. Do you, you're not a guitar hoarder or oh, collector no. or anything? No. 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 I mean, I've got, I, what I play now is, is these, they're built by uh, the Fender Custom Shop for me, and I've got about seven of them, I suppose. Right. Um, Can I've you got... tell them apart? <laughs> oh, they all sound different. Right. Yeah, okay. yeah. they've all got their own sound. That's Definitely. interesting. Yeah. yeah. Do you have a? I know a lot of guitarists have like this process of like they they will when they go guitar shopping they will do this thing where they will knock on the neck and the body mm. and see what the resonance is and they yeah. have all these special. Do you have anything like that or you well, just? Well, I mean, when I used to go shopping for guitars i always used to check them out um acoustically right yeah if they've got a good acoustic sound you know you've got a chance of yeah. making something out of it you know yeah. but um since they're being made sort of to my specification they they all seem to to work uh let's talk a bit about uh, other equipment as well because we've got uh, some of your rig is here uh, what what are you kind of like think every time you go on stage like, there's absolutely no way i could go on stage without such and such a pedal or amplifier or well all the pedals i use i've been using them for years apart from uh the thing called a plimp sole which is an overdrive pedal 
and I've been using that for about a year now. They're all made by uh, Mike Fuller, Full Tone right. in California. Yep. And I've been using his pedals since uh, the 90s, early 90s. Uh, it's just the stuff it really suits suits me, you know. Yeah. And do, you, do you have a favourite uh, Plimsoll, is it? or That, that Plimsoll is... is is the one I'm using now and have been for for a while, but um, you know I've used quite a few of his different, and there's also a signature model overdrive as well yeah. of mine, which I used to use, but I've switched to this now. Yeah, right. you've been around a little while now, Robin. Right? You've seen things come and go. What about uh, equipment-wise? How has it how has it changed over the years, and is it better now, or is it was it better back then? Um. I think the stuff I use is is sort of modern, more reliable versions of what I used right. in, the, in the 60s, 70s sort of thing. Um, and, and the amps as well. Uh, these are all modern versions of, of, of older amps, basically. You know, right. they're, they're reissues so, of older amps that I use. So I haven't really moved on, <laughs> basically. <laughs> but if you've got it right in the first time, then well, well, why, why change, eh? Yeah. So these are a couple of Marshalls we've got here in the yeah. studio with you. Is that, that's always been your, kind of your, your amp of choice, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, definitely, yeah. Uh, uh, it's got, uh, Marshalls have got a big voice to them, which you can't really get out of other amps. I'm yeah. not saying other amps aren't great. There are lots of great amps. Yeah. But I just particularly like that really big voice. Yeah. How do you like the, uh, <laughs> I mean, the Marshalls, they're quite a big thing to lump around, aren't they? I mean, that's, that's, I would have thought with modern technology, we could start getting amps a bit smaller, but they still seem to be kind of the same size, right? Yeah. Well, if you want to get that sound, right, you, you've got to have a, all the heavy duty stuff. You've got to put your back into it. Yeah, eh? yeah that's it. Yeah. <laughs> or get a roadie. <laughs> definitely. definitely. I, I couldn't lift it. Oh, right. It's too yeah. heavy for me. <laughs> you've got to keep the arms supple for playing guitar though right i mean you know absolutely yeah 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 i want to talk about um recording as well um because as i mentioned earlier like you've done 30 over 30 albums uh what is it 23 of those studio albums i think right um i'll take your word for it uh, <laughs> I've no idea yeah something like that yeah and um back in the early days recording very basic i mean a lot of it would, would have been done live in the studio right yeah you know no overdubs as time's gone on we've got more tracks more equipment and all that yeah how's that opened things up for you do, do you i take it you prefer the kind of modern way do you or do you long for those old school days well i like the sound of of when you used to go to tape you know when it was 16 track tape i think that was the best it ever right. ever, ever sounded right that yeah. was the pinnacle for you was yeah. it kind of that that's the best it ever yeah. sounded but you know, um, working on computer now, it saves you so much time. That's the thing. Yeah. You know, it, it yeah. just, and I'm able to uh, now go in the studio with an idea, put stuff down to a, a machine drum track yeah. and build it up from there and get right. every part, you know, exactly how I want it. So that's how you work now these yeah, days. That's, that's, how, that's how I work. Do you demo now. songs like that and kind of... Uh, well, I suppose it, in a way it starts off as a demo, doesn't right, it? You yeah. know, I, I put the guitar part down uh, and then maybe a guide vocal, then the bass, then get the drummer in. Right. Yeah. You know, it's all that kind of thing. But the great thing about that is, is if I'm not happy with uh, one of the guitar part, the sound of it, I can replace it, do it again. Right. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not. Yeah. So, you know, you really can um, get things right yeah you know how you're happy with it are you quite hands-on in the studio with the recording process or is no it... i don't know anything about recording at all <laughs> <laughs> that's all that technical stuff you know luckily enough um the engineer i used you know he, he's great he's got yeah he's got it all at his fingertips yeah so it's a it's like a it's like a, some sort of magic for you is it just well just like... i mean let's face it you know as a musician you're looking at a screen which has got a load of what things that look like faders on it but yeah. it's not really faders yeah <laughs> you know what i mean it's you can't actually get your hands on it at all yeah yeah it's just down to the guy that's running the mouse you know yeah <laughs> yeah it's a strange world we live yeah, in. yeah but it? it works you know it, it's been working for me um and uh dig, digital recording has come such a long way now that yeah. you know and they've got all this analog sort of uh i know it's still digital but that it's emulators, imita haven't they? Yeah, yeah it yeah. imitates analog effects and that you know yeah yeah so you'd be 
you, you'd rather be recording these days than back in the old days, eh? I think so, because, as I say, it allows me to get every part exactly what I want. Yeah. Rather, when you're playing live, you're relying on other musicians yeah. a lot, you know. Yeah. And, so, uh, do you get a little bit frustrated about that? Sort of thinking, um, oh, this is how I want it, but, I, you know, I've got to leave it to someone else to yeah. do it. I don't think I got frustrated at the time. I just, I've just learned over the last few albums, particularly the last two or three, you know, that um, I'm happier with the end product if I can, like I play bass myself, you know, right. so I get, get that part exactly yeah. right and work on the drum parts with, with the drummer, you know, and get that exactly right. Yeah. So it's all, it's all part of getting it to, to mesh, Yeah. you know, to, to, to mesh behind what the vocal or the lead guitar is doing, you know. Over the years, I mean, you've worked with some, some great drummers, bass players, you know, um, Jack Bruce. Yeah. Think about. Did you pick up much from those guys? Uh, I'm not sure I did. I, I think... <laughs> I, I, I did mean, they you, pick up much from you? I, I wouldn't <laughs> like to say that. Um, you know, working with Jack, you know, amazing amazing player and and the fire yeah you know the fire wonderful and and we had a great time working together we, we really enjoyed it especially our uh, the last album we did which was seven moons the last studio album we did we were both very proud of that right yeah i think to be honest i live in my own musical world so much you know that i'm not really influenced anymore and haven't been for right. for decades Right. You know, it's when you go back to the people that I'm still being influenced today by Howling Wolf, you know, yeah. Albert King, yeah. Jimi Hendrix, you know, I, that's what I was talking about earlier about it's it's in there deep and I, yeah. I keep drawing on it, you know. Do you find yourself going back to some of those old, rec old records and hearing new stuff in there all the time and thinking, oh, you know. I, I don't, uh, I do still play Howling Wolf stuff, I must admit. Yeah, uh, that, that, <laughs> that is. That is sort of the, the only one that I, I go back to and still it's like a mystery what it right. is. Yeah. It's it's like how is that doing what it's doing? Yeah. Know, and it's um and as I say, him more than anybody today is is still inspiring a lot of what I do. Yeah. Yeah. Is there any of those real old guys, blues guys you'd love to meet? I got to meet BB King. Nice. Yeah. How um, was that? It was great. I mean I just sort of said I'm a big fan. Yeah. He shook my hand, you know, yeah. which was great. I got to meet uh, Howling Wolf. Wow. Because uh, we, we did a show in Chicago when I was in Progo Haram. Yeah. And um, Bobby Bland. I met Bobby Blue Bland. Bobby Bland. Yeah. Right, yeah, big fan of his. Yeah, yeah. Went, to, went to a gig nice. in, in Los Angeles, only a little club. But um, lucky enough, I was taken backstage to say hello, and, and uh, that was a big thrill. Yeah, very jealous about that. Is there anyone that you didn't get a chance to meet that you would have loved to have seen? I'm sure there's lots, but anyone who stands out in particular? Um, well, I, I only saw Albert King once live, right. but I didn't get to meet him, unfortunately. That wasn't possible. Yeah. But he was the best guitar player I've ever seen live. Really, yeah? Without a doubt. Unbelievable. Wow. In fact, for about a year after seeing him, I wanted to give up playing the guitar. It, <laughs> it was just so far out there, you know. What was it about Albert's playing that really uh, drew you in? Well, obviously, it's incredibly soulful. Yeah. But it has a, a musical beauty to it as well, it, melodically. Yeah. Um, Got a favourite song of Albert's? Well, I really like the guitar playing on uh, Personal Manager. Right, yeah. Uh, and I'd say Crosscut Saw would be the the other one. That, right, but I, yeah. I, I love a lot of his stuff. Yeah. A lot, a lot of great guitar. But that only gives you a small percentage of what you got off of him live. Right. When, when he was at his peak. I think a lot of those blues guys, uh, you know, quite quite restricted by what they were doing on record because back in those days... They might have even been cutting straight to the vinyl or something, you know, three minutes yeah. per side, and that was it. So yeah, yeah. there wasn't much chance for guitar solos or anything. Was uh, it? It was, all, uh, all had to go down live. I'm sure all his stuff yeah. went down live, you know, when he was with Stax. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. But I think seeing them live, they've got so much more scope. To well, go they've got to, more, freed you know, more yeah, freedom. Just to go off and, I've been enjoying this, right, let's get it, you know, we're yeah. in the groove here, let's go, yeah. yeah. So, 
I uh, I, there's a lot of guys I would have liked to see live, but uh, well, yeah. I mean, there's um, there's a live album of, of Albert King. Uh, that's that does give you an inkling of, of right what what he was capable of. Yeah, uh, it's quite a long career you've had. Now most people would have taken a little break at some point, right? Or uh, you know had a a bit of gap there somewhere or other. But you did well. Yeah. See, from what I'm looking yeah. at, you've, you've consistently put albums out. There's never been that much of a gap. I mean, what was it? A couple of weeks was it? <laughs> <laughs> now I actually took about four, nearly five years off the road. Right. Yeah, because my children were all at an age where I needed to be around a bit more. And um, but I did. I did still record uh, an album during that time or two albums right. during that time. Yeah. <laughs> so that's pretty good going right yeah. I mean, how do you keep up the energy or is it that's what keeps you going yeah I, I think um, as I say you know it's it's having that engine that, right. that drives you forward you yeah. know something um, you have to do is it is... well the thing is you pick up the guitar to play because you enjoy playing you come up with an idea you write a song right you've got a song you need to record it yeah <laughs> so, so you know that that's it you can't have songs they're not going to be recorded. It's just something you've got to do, is it? You've, you've got, got to. You you've know. got to be put down. You know, that's yeah. the thing. They've got to go out. I read that. Uh, you know, when you were sixteen, you started a job as a as a window cleaner with your brother. Yes, right. What What do you think you'd be doing now if you hadn't discovered the guitar? You wouldn't surely still be window cleaning, would you? I mean, <laughs> who, I mean, who, who can t- yeah. who can tell? Uh, who knows what what I could have ended up doing. Um, was there I've any ne- other ideas at that age that you might you know? Not really, no. Uh, I was only interested in music, even right from about 14, 15. Yeah. That was the main thing. My schooling efforts were poor because of, <laughs> you know, I was just sort of, my head was in rock yeah. and roll, basically. Yeah. It was the same for me. I was I was forever bunking off maths so I could go down to the music room and play, you know, yeah. on the piano or the double bass or the guitar or something. And I think some people are just... They're not just, they're not academic. You, you're more creative, aren't you? And that's, that's obviously, right. that's you know, right. where you're coming from. Yeah. Yeah. That's absolutely fantastic. Um, I want to ask you a question that I ask on all these podcasts. Now, this is, you, stick with me here on this one. This is a bit convoluted, right? I want you to imagine it's in the future, okay? And it's the last day of the world. The world is about to end. Right. Okay, and uh, sound the, familiar? Yeah, <laughs> I didn't say how far in the future, <laughs> yeah. right? But um, the world government has come to you and said, Robin, to celebrate the end of the world, we want to go out with a bang. We want you to put together a band and put on one almighty concert. Now, what band are you going to pick to play with you, and what song are you going to open up with? I'd be hard pushed. Be- between my two favourite singers, one would be James Brown, the other one would be uh, Howling Wolf. Um, I'd have definitely have Jack on bass, right, and vocals as well. Um, I like Charlie Watts. Yeah, great drummer. Drums, yeah. Um, Booker T. Nice on the keys. Yeah. 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 That do it. And what are you going to open with? Um, well, if it's James Brown, I think probably, uh, Papa's got a brand new bag. Nice. If it's Howling Wolf, 44. Fantastic. Fantastic. See, now that question has stumped most people. They've kind of come to this point and they've gone, oh my God, I don't know. But you, you've gone <laughs> straight in there and you, you know, you've nailed it straight away, haven't you? I've got one more question for you though. You've got Howling Wolf and James Brown on stage. Now, how are you going to keep those two guys from killing each other? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. Um, I, I think they probably have a mutual respect yeah. for each other. Yeah. yeah. You don't think they'd be like, no, I'm the star of the show. No, I'm yeah. the star of the show. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> yeah. Do you get involved in much band politics, like that sort of thing? Or is these days, is it fairly easy plain sailing? Uh, I'm very fortunate uh, in the guys that I work with and have worked with for the last few years. They're just great musicians uh, who are, 
you know, they they're just happy to um, you know to play exactly right. what I need. Yeah. Which you know must be pretty unique. I would have thought. Yeah. In the music industry, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of egos, isn't there? So it's uh... you can you can come across it yeah. occasionally. Yeah. For sure. Uh, are you most happy with the sort of power trio lineup these yeah. days, or would you you know, given the chance like the end of the world concert? Would you be chucking in some keys there and maybe a bit of brass section or? Oh, I do occasionally use keys on record. You right. Know, uh, on this new one um, that I've just finished, that that's due out in the summer, um, I've I've got um, Paddy Milner on on B three. Lovely, for, lovely for Paddy. Th yeah. For, for about three songs, you know, right. uh, which you've done a lovely job, you know, and I would consider using, uh, you know keyboards live if you know i couldn't do a song without it yeah, and yeah. i needed to do it sort of thing yeah but i'm i'm happy with a three piece you right know, it, it, i think it's about three pieces everybody's got to work a bit harder to make up for the music the, yeah. the instrument that's missing basically because yeah. there's a definitely an instrument missing uh and i think that's what gives it its dyna dynamic quality you know? right yeah. is it that little bit of danger that you've you yeah. know because you're a little bit on the edge yeah making it making you know the sound full enough yeah so we had a couple of fan questions come in uh via facebook uh, to the blues podcast and uh some cat called richard wants to know now he says bj wilson reg isador and bill lorden all amazing drummers right uh, who was your personal favourite to work with? Now, can, can you say that out loud? <laughs> That's a cheeky question, right? Um, they all all had totally different right. qualities. That's the thing. Yeah. I mean, BJ was a lovely guy, great drummer. Uh, he was great for Procol because he had drama in his playing, you know? Right. Reg was what I would call a very, very soulful drummer. Um, he could, you know, you could listen to him just playing a beat and it would groove. Yeah. You know, so he, he had that magic about yeah. him. Uh, and Bill was like Mr. Flash, you know, it, just technically sort yeah. of amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So he, he, each one, I enjoyed playing with each one of them. That's a very diplomatic answer. I like it I very thought much. So. Yeah. <laughs> Let's have one more fan question. Uh, we are going to have a question from uh, from Robin this time. Um, Robin says, uh, just wondering what your relationship with Gary Brooker is and would you ever consider a one-off performance with Procol Harum? Sorry, that's from Howard. You're Robin, aren't you? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> um, I get on very well with Gary. I mean, you know, we're in contact uh, and I keep saying to myself, I'm going to get over... Yeah. And visit him before we both pop our clogs, you know. <laughs> um, but we're obviously both pretty busy. Um, I can't see ever doing a Procol no? concert again. I think that music is is so far away right, from yeah. where I am now. Yeah. I don't think I could reach back to it. I don't think I'd be able to get in there somehow. Yeah. I think it's too different for me now. <laughs> I've got uh, one more question as well I want to ask and um, this, this is a tricky one think about this one who is the worst person you ever worked with the worst person <laughs> now this is a good sign you can't think of anybody no, that's, I, can't, that's... I can't really think of anybody I mean I would have thought in a career as, as long and, and as full as yours uh, there must have been somebody who wound you up at some point <laughs> Apart from me, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can't really think. I mean, Jack could be sometimes, you know, a little bit prickly, uh, yeah. but I loved him. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and he was such a great guy, really. But, you know, occasionally you get a little bit prickly, but I can't really think of any, any anybody that, you know, I could say, oh, it's, he's the worst I ever worked with. Yeah. No, I've been very, very fortunate. That is very, yeah, very lucky yeah, to say yeah. in a, a career that, like yours. That, yeah. uh, that is amazing. Maybe that's just, you know, a, a tribute on how much of a lovely guy you are. Oh. Really, so <laughs> uh, let's finish up with one, one last thing. Um, you know, out of everything you've done, this massive career, 
you know, done so many records, done so many live gigs, played with so many people. What's left for you to do? Is, this, is there one thing that you're still sort of grasping at and thinking, oh, I'd love to do that? I'd love to put that band together <laughs> for the end of the world. That's, that's, that's my big ambition. <laughs> that, well, that would be something, wouldn't it? I mean, yeah. that would be a way to go out. Yeah. That really would. Yeah, I'd love to see that band, I tell you. <laughs> yeah, I'd be, I'd be there for the concert. Yeah. You wouldn't have any choice if it was the end of the world. <laughs> Everybody would have to come. That's true. <laughs> Robin, it's been so fantastic to talk to you, Dave. Thank so, you. Thank you so much for chatting to us. My pleasure. Don't forget, you can find us on all the social medias. We are at the blues podcast official so check it out give us a like we'd love you for that <laughs>